Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free Microsoft 7680 certification training course on authentication and authorization. I'm James Messer. And in this module, we're going to look at the requirements from our Configuring Access to Resources module, our section of that 7680. This one is specific to configuring authentication and authorization in Windows 7. There is a lot to authentication and authorization in the Windows 7 operating system. We're going to go through all of these results resolving authentication issues, resolving and configuring rights, managing credentials and certificates. We're going to talk about smart cards and something called PIV. We'll also talk about elevating user privileges and something called multi-factor authentication. There's a section of permissions that we really haven't talked about so far. We have looked at NTFS file partitions. We've looked in previous videos at share permissions when you access files across the network. But there's a section of permissions that really goes beyond files and folders in your operating system. You would configure these rights in the group policy settings under computer configuration, under policies. You go down to your Windows settings under your security settings, local policies. Finally, you'll get to user rights assignment. These user rights are pretty interesting. They're a little bit different than the NTFS and share permissions because these control the way the operating system works. There's parts of the operating system you may not want people to have access to, other parts of the operating system that may be OK for people to access. And you can do this by changing these settings. Maybe you'd like to allow people to log in locally. Maybe not. Maybe you'd like them to be able to change the time zone of a computer, maybe you wouldn't like them to have that access. There are a lot of different rights and permissions. You can find them all in that group policy setting. Here's our group policy settings. I've already gone into on this computer the computer configuration under Windows settings, I've gone down to security settings, chosen local policies, and gone to user rights assignments. It's way in there, but you'll often need to have access to these. And if you look through just a few of these, you'll get a feel on why these are a little bit different. For instance, here's change the system time. Do we want to allow people to be able to change the time on the system or not? Maybe that's something that we would like to manage from an administrative level and not grant access to be able to do that. Other things like denying log on as a service or log on locally may have security implications. Maybe that's something you don't want to allow for certain users or certain groups. And you can certainly apply a group policy to those OUs, those organizations organizational units that are in your domain. Maybe lock pages in memory. This really does change the way the operating system is working. And if we scroll down a little more, even things like shutting down the system, something that we're so accustomed to doing, you may not want certain users being able to shut down the computer. And you can allow or disallow those user rights to the operating system right here in the group policy. If you've ever logged into a website or logged onto a local resource that's on your network, you may have seen a little box that's in that dialog option that says, remember my credentials. You may wonder, where does it remember those? Where does it put them? It puts them in the location called the Windows Vault. And it uses this as a central repository for all of these different credentials. This is what the Windows Vault looks like. We're going to dive into the Credential Manager and look at the Windows Vault in just a moment. You can also go into this section and choose the option to add your own. Even if you haven't visited a site yet, you can type in that information for that resource along with the username and password that you'd like to have, and that would add it to the Windows Vault without having to go to that resource to begin with. This is a pretty important group of information, as you might have already figured out. It has all your usernames in it, all your passwords. There's a lot of really good stuff there. And if you move from one computer to another, you may want to make sure that you continue to have access to that Windows Vault. So there is an option in here to be able to both back up the vault and restore the vault so that if you are moving to a different computer, you can take your vault with you. You can manage the Windows Vault from the Credential Manager. You can find that in your Control Panel. We'll choose Control Panel, and there it is, Credential Manager. The Credential Manager gives you this central place where you can go to a machine and be able to add certificate-based credentials. You can add a generic credential into here. Just add the network address or resource, the username or password that you'd like to use. And also here is where you would back up or restore the vault. Let's say we wanted to back up this vault to another location. I could choose where I would like to back it up to. And you have access to where this would go. Let's just put this on our desktop for now. And let's call this our Atlantis 
PC backup and save that. And that looks good. We'll click Next. And it says, press Control-Alt-Delete to continue your backup on the secure desktop. If you recall from our previous video where we talked about user account control, we talked about why the secure desktop is really important. That's because we don't want other machines or other third-party applications automatically scripting things for us. The secure desktop stops everything on the computer and prompts you so that you are the only one who could ever type in a username and password or the option to continue with what you were doing. That's pretty important, especially when it goes to all of your stored names and passwords. You don't want those getting out to someone else, so you don't want a third party getting access to those. So you must hit Control-Alt-Delete and have the option to protect the backup file with a password. Now we're at the secure desktop. So let's add Add a password into this mix and click Next. Oh, it doesn't meet my domain's complexity policy. Let's give it a really good password. It's pretty important for your Windows Vault that your password is complex enough. It says the backup was successful. If we save this on removable media, we can remove it and put it somewhere safe. I'm just going to click Finish. And you can see right here is our Atlantis PC backup. And there's a little icon for the managed information card that was created for those credentials. And to restore that, you simply repeat the process. Choose the backup location of where that file happens to be, so Atlanta's PC backup. And then you can perform the same process and add the password that you added when you created it. And it says those credentials have been restored. So it's that easy to back up and restore those. Just have to make sure you take advantage of that secure desktop setting and that you're able to take that file and maybe move it to another computer to restore those credentials. Credentials are one thing. Credentials are usernames and passwords. But as you may recall, things like EFS didn't use usernames and passwords. They used keys. They used encryption certificates to be able to use those. Those certificates are stored and accessed through this certificate manager. It's under the Manage File Encryption Certificates. If you go to your Start menu and you type that in, it'll bring up this Cert MGR, the Cert Manager, and you're able to get access to all of the certificates that are on your computer. You can also just type in Cert MGR MSC, and it will also bring up this certificates console. If you recall, when we were working with EFS, we also stored some of these keys right from the command line using the cipher command. So you have a few options, whether it's in the GUI or whether you're at the command line, to be able to take those very, very important certificates and archive them off. You might need them for later. Let's start our certificate manager. I'm going to go to our start menu here, and let's just type in cert MGR. MSC. That will bring up our certificate manager. Look at all the different certificates that we have inside of Windows. There's quite a few here. A lot of these are used in your browser. Some are used for things like personal certificates. If you were setting up an encrypted file system, it would create a personal certificate for you right here. And this is where you can take these certificates, open them up, have a look at the certificates that are here, the details associated with the encryption certificate, and the path of where you can find that certificate. And that certificate happens to be OK. With all of these, you're able to perform some functions on here. You can import certificates, request new certificates. There's a lot of things associated with the encryption methods that we would have to create custom requests, enroll behalf of, manage enrollment policies. Everything you can think of needing to do in your Windows desktop with certificates you should be able to do right here from the Certificate Manager. If you wanted to save one of these certificates or move one to another machine, you can also right mouse click on an individual certificate, choose All Tasks, and you can see you have an option here to export that certificate. And it steps you through a wizard that you're able to use that says, do you want to export the private key along with the certificate? Private key usually, as the name implies, is something that usually should be kept private. This is something that allows you to decrypt this data afterwards. So you may not want to do that for this. You get to choose the format that you'd like to use. And then you can specify where you would like to put that file. We'll put it right on the desktop. And this will be our EFS backup. And I can choose Save, and it will change, save the configuration and export it. And there is my EFS backup public key side of the certificate, not the private key, because I didn't choose that right there on your desktop. So you've got a lot of control here. And now that you're in this certificate manager, you can really choose to do a lot of things with all of the certificates on your Windows 7 system. 
If you recall from the original requirements for this module, one of them was smart cards with PIV. That PIV stands for Personal Identity Verification. The idea is that we create these smart cards and really create a system that would make sure that whoever had that card uh, could really be identified with the information on that card. But PIV goes much farther beyond there just being a card that can be read. It is really a standard that specifies how you capture and store biometric data, what cryptographic algorithms are used to store this information on the smart card, what size of cryptographic keys you should be using for that. There are a lot of details regarding PIV. For our purposes, we just need to know that it's a standard that's associated with the storage and the formatting of this information. If you wanted more information about it, you can go to this URL and read all about how PIV is used for these environments. The idea is that instead of having your certificate on your computer, you just take it with you. It's on a card. You can see these smart cards have these tiny little chips on them that allow us to store the information right there on the card. This also allows us to take advantage of that and be able to use multi-factor authentication. This means that we're typing in more than just a username and a password. We're typing in other things that couldn't possibly be known. Maybe it's biometric information. Maybe you have to specify that the card is put into a slot and your fingerprint is scanned at the same time. That would really verify that it's you logging onto this computer. You knew your username, you knew your password, you had a smart card with you, and you used biometrics. All of those different factors, your password and the biometrics and the smart card, mean that we're using multi-factored authentication to be able to get into this computer. This PIV capability is something where you don't have to load additional software. You don't have to load drivers from a third party. It's built into Windows 7. If you go to your computer configuration policies, Windows settings, security settings, local policies, and security options, in your group policy, you'll be able to make changes to the options here for PIV. One is for interactive logon to require a smart card. The other group policy under interactive logon is the smart card removal behavior. What happens when you pull that smart card out of your computer? So you could force everyone to log on with their smart card. And if that smart card is ever removed, you could have it log off automatically. That means you have to be there with your card to be able to get into those resources. And if you don't have the card, you're not there, then you won't have access to what you need on that computer. In older versions of Windows, one of the challenges you had is that if somebody wanted to log on or run a program as someone other than the current logged in user, you had to log completely out, log in as that user, and then they'd be able to run things under their rights and permissions. Well, with these elevation of user privileges in Windows 7, you don't have to do that. You can run programs as other users. You choose, so you can see here, run as administrator. That's one you may have seen before. Here's another one, run as a different user on this desktop, even if it's not the administrator. And you don't have to log out to be able to do that. You simply, as you're selecting an application, hold down the Shift key and right mouse click on that particular application, and you'll be able to run as a different user. That new prompt will pop up in the GUI. Of course, there are ways to do this at the command line as well. You use a command called run as. You run as. You can choose a profile or choose not to run a profile. You can use the, and save the credentials on this computer. Oh, and then you choose the username and the password for the programs you'd like to be able to run. And this is with a very simple way to start up at the command line or start up in the GUI the ability to run another program, but run it as if you were someone else. And that person who's running it as someone else now has access to files and rights and permissions and settings that normally the other person wouldn't have. A good way to see this work is to bring up our task manager. If we right mouse click down here at the bottom and choose Start Task Manager, one of the things you see for all the processes running on your computer is a column for username. I'll make this a little bit smaller, and we'll move it off to the side so we can watch what happens when we start up these other applications. Whenever we start an application, like we start Calculator, it's going to bring up the calc.exe right here, and it's going to have our username right next to it. If we close the calculator, obviously, that will disappear. Well, now let's run this calculator. I'm going to hold down my Shift key and right mouse click on calculator. And there's an option here to run as different user. If I was just going to choose the calculator and right mouse click, notice you don't have the same number of options there. By holding down that Shift key, it expands out the functions available to you. I want to run as a different user. And in this domain, I'm going to choose Samantha Carter. And I'm going to choose Samantha's 
password and click OK, it's still going to run calculator. But notice the username here is different. It's now Samantha Carter. Now I can start and stop different applications right here on this computer's desktop as different users, but I don't have to log out to be able to do that. And as long as I'm running as Samantha Carter's username, I have all the rights and permissions associated with that user from inside of this one program. One of the biggest challenges you're going to have with authentication is somebody not being able to authenticate. They've forgotten their password. They can't remember exactly what it was. And that can create some big problems. If you're on a domain, you don't have to worry about this so much. Everything from a user perspective is administered centrally. You can go to a central manager, go to one of your domain administrators, and they can reset your password for you. But on a local computer that's not part of a domain, you need to have some other options. One of those options is to use an option called Create a Password Reset Disk. This is right from your User Accounts section in the Control Panel. There's an option on the left-hand menu that says Create a Password Reset Disk, and then you can do exactly that. If you go to our User Accounts under Manage Accounts and change that, you need to keep in mind that you may lose access to anything that you've encrypted with that encrypting file system. That's based on your login information. And if you change and reset your password, it's no longer ha going to have the same access. So one of the nice things to have available, and we've done this in previous videos, is to back up that EFS certificate and be able to restore it back once you gain access to the system again so you would then have access to those EFS encrypted files. Let's look at the user section on where we might do that. On our Windows 7 system, if we go to our control panel and we go all the way down to the bottom under User Accounts, this computer is not part of a domain. So you'll see this option here for Create a Password Reset Disk. If this computer is a member of the domain, that option won't even be there and available to you. And it steps you through some prompts here. It's going to also require that you have a USB flash drive plugged into your computer to be able to do this or to have a separate uh, removable type of storage on your computer computer to be able to do this. And it will step you through the password and save it off to that. And then you can put that USB drive or you can put that floppy disk or that removable storage somewhere safe just in case someday you happen to forget what your password is. Later, if you forget your password, you're at the login prompt and you type in a password and it just isn't working for you, one of the options you have is to reset the password. And you can see that this feature requires removable media. So you'll have your USB drive that you'll plug in. And then it will be able to read the password recovery disk and take you through the wizard to be able to recover the password for that particular user's account. Let's review some of the topics from this video. Our first question, what's the best way to back up the certificates used for the encrypting file system? we got a couple of options here. You could go into the Certificates Console, or you could use Cypher.exe to be able to recover those. Our next question, how can you force everyone to use their smart card to log into the domain? something called multi-factor authentication. To require it, to force that particular requirement, you would change your group policy settings. You can find those in your computer configuration, Windows settings, security settings, local policies under security options. And our last question, how can you move stored login information from one computer to another? It can come in handy if you're changing computers. You want to take all your usernames and passwords with you. You would back up and restore those using the Windows Vault. That covers our requirements in this authentication and authorization video. We've gone through quite a bit. We have gone through configuring rights, managing credentials and certificates. We've learned about smart cards with PIV. We have elevated and used different user privileges. And we use multi-factor authentication. And finally, we resolve some of those authentication issues. If you'd like to watch any of our absolutely free Microsoft videos, you'd like to participate in our message boards, or you'd like to send me a message, you can visit our website at ProfessorMesser.com.